In this Research Methods podcast, we'll be discussing naturalistic inquiry with brief introductions to ethnography, ethnomethodology, and the critical incident technique. But first, let's understand what I mean by naturalistic inquiry. This is research that focuses on how people behave when they're conducting their real lives in the real world. You can think of it kind of like reality TV. The only difference is that it's authentic, without people hamming it up for the TV screens or trying to make a living off of it. You know, it's actual real life. If we want to understand naturalistic inquiry, think about the flowers of visual metaphor for the research. The researchers at the center of the structure and the petals represent the characteristics linked together needed to effectively execute and understand how to go about doing naturalistic inquiry. So first, it needs to be conducted in ordinary places where people live, work, shop, and so on. Any typical setting could be a location for collecting data with naturalistic inquiry. Second, tacit knowledge is typically the focus of this type of research. There are basically two kinds of knowledge. Explicit knowledge, which is what we learn in schools, in our lessons, by laws, so on and so forth. It's codified. It's written down. Tacit knowledge, on the other hand, we can think of as linked with acculturation. So there's learning the rules for how a society or organization works, and then there's learning how things actually get done. Technically speaking, tacit knowledge represents those skills, information, processes, ideas, and experience that people have in their head. It guides their actions, but they're not written down or codified by rules. So think, for example, of the notion of professionalism, or how we ought to behave in a professional ex environment. This is a good example of tacit knowledge. We learn how to be professionals by observing others in informal conversations, and sometimes when we unwittingly violate some unwritten rule and we're told off for it. In cultural studies, these are often thought of as social scripts. Naturalistic inquiry is typically interested in better understanding these because they're incredibly powerful at all levels of society from the family to broad national cultures and pretty much everything in between. Third, naturalistic inquiry uses ideographic interpretation. So it's interested in the individual's or the group's experience within a particular context. Other types of research will try to create generalizable rules, but ideographic interpretation is about understanding the particulars of the context and how that enables or constrains our own behaviors. So it focuses on why questions, not what questions. So if we're trying to understand a concept from a naturalistic perspective, we keep asking why. Fourth, by its nature, naturalistic inquiry is flexible. So there's always room for different approaches to understanding people, how they behave in different circumstances, and why they behave that way. So how we approach our research questions using naturalistic inquiry is largely dependent on what our questions are and what we think is a good route to getting them. Other kinds of research are more rigid in their methodologies, but that's also because they have different types of goals and priorities. Yet, one of the challenges is getting access to different groups or being allowed insights into people's attitudes, their behaviors and thoughts. So this means that we as researchers also have to be trustworthy to varying degrees. The more intimate the kind of knowledge or, or risky, the more trust you have to earn from the participants. So public behaviors are easier to access, but people often notice when they're being watched and so they'll change their behaviors. This is called the Hawthorne effect. People modify or improve aspects of their behavior in response to their awareness of being observed. So in the 1920s, a factory had invited researchers to try and improve their floor production processes and discovered that without the researchers doing anything other than being there, productivity increased. But when the researchers left, productivity dropped. So a key lesson learned in the Hawthorne studies was that people will perform differently when they know that they're being observed. Then finally, it's about interpretation effectively, the negotiated outcomes. So the interpretation of results that you have with naturalistic inquiry relies on both sense-making and feedback. 
This can include feedback from the participants in the research themselves to check to see if your observations resonate with them. You know, it doesn't matter if they like what you think of them, but they have to recognize themselves and also act to assess them with other research. So the assumption is that with peer review, multiple eyes, we can better interpret the findings. So with this kind of a background in naturalistic inquiry, we ought to look at some of the particular methods associated with that. But if we want to think about the key points, its purpose is to really describe and explain participants' behaviors, attitudes, ideas, and beliefs. It's also grounded by the belief that people should be studied in their natural environments. And it's an analysis of how participants perceive their own experiences, as well as how the researcher interprets them. So the researchers have to put their expectations to the side or make their norms, values, and ideology apparent. They can't assume necessarily that they are the same as those of the folks that they're trying to observe. When we put this together, we take a look then at our first type of naturalistic inquiry method, and this is ethnography. Now, we're not going to talk about all of the different types of natural inquiry methods, but I'm going to introduce three of the most common types that are often applied in organizational settings for different kinds of purposes. When it comes to ethnography, this was first used by anthropologists to describe cultures other than their own and it involves research conducted by immersion in the context. So it's about examining the patterns of interactions and symbols to identify this, this kind of implicit knowledge that we were talking about. But it's about being there. It's about understanding and living kind of amongst the natives in using the old anthropological approach to it. But the purpose of this is pretty straightforward. Ethnographers are trying to seek and discover and disclose social understandings, the tacit knowledge that people try and, try and live their lives by. This is the purpose of ethnography. But if we want to think about this in an organizational setting, and we want to apply it to organizations, then ethnography is a way of understanding the particulars of daily life in such a way as to increase the success probability of a new product or service, or more appropriately, to reduce the probability of failure because of a lack of understanding of the basic behaviors and frameworks of employees, of consumers, of anyone that the organization has to deal with. Some researchers have argued that in the fields interested in understanding consumers, ethnography itself provides key information for making strategic business, marketing, human resource, and public relations decisions for the success of design of product and services to actually meet real people's needs instead of inventing the needs just because they have a new product. So businesses, too, have found ethnographers helpful for understanding how people use their organization, their products, their services. So companies can make increasing use of ethnographic methods to understand consumers and consumption for new product development and certainly for employee experience evaluation. So an ethnographer's systematic and holistic approach to real life experience is valued by product developers. In particular, those who use the method in order to understand unsatiated desires and cultural practices that surround products, whereas focus groups a lot of times will fail to inform marketers about what people really do. Ethnography links people what they say they want to do and avoid the pitfalls of re only relying on self-reported focus group based data. There are some good examples of organizational ethnographies. The Hawthorne studies from the 1920s that I mentioned when we were talking about trustworthiness uh, are certainly an example, but that study is also interesting because it found that the social environment was critical for improving work motivation. Having a place where people, employees in particular, could briefly socialize in their day improved their attitude about work. It also found that cliques were a normal part of any organization, that we tend to organize ourselves in our work environments into distinct networks with their own norms and their own attitudes within the organization.
A second example is the Jackall study. It's a critical evaluation of the manager's world, how moral principles get converted into sometimes ruthless politics in organizations. So it discusses the problems of access and what they signal. That is, that oftentimes managers just don't trust outside researchers. The Semitech studies of the 1990s were also interesting, there are a series of studies about how collaborative organizations can form in highly competitive industries. In this case, the high-tech semiconductor industry in the U.S. was the focus for the Semitech studies. So what they found was that in order to advance shared goals, to improve the science and the engineering behind semiconductors, to benefit the whole industry, they needed to produce a, a good organizational environment. So the study revealed a lot about charismatic leadership and a flat organizational structure that fundamentally helped to change how business is done and how organizations simply organize themselves in the, the high-tech industry. And then finally, the contract engineer studies of the 2000s were observations of contract engineers in staffing agencies. And so it was about these studies were about the changing forms of work identity and how engineers constructed their commitment and their own psychological contract to the company. So no matter whether we're talking about consumer based studies or employee management-based studies, ethnography offers us a lot of understanding of different kinds of concepts than we can get with a lot of different kinds of techniques and other research objectives. But if we go from ethnography to our second methodology, ethnomethodology, we can see some different kinds of objectives, purposes, and interests emerging with this kind of naturalistic inquiry method. So with ethnomethodology, the goal is, in, is really about understanding what's taken for granted in the organization and uncovering and analyzing the meanings of the everyday. So we can think about the differences between ethnography and ethnomethodology in two ways. First, while traditional ethnography offers us an analysis of society that takes the social order for granted, ethnomethodology is concerned with the pro procedures, so the practices, the methods, by which any social order is produced and shared. It's all about how we structure ourselves in social, organizational, whatever kind of setting that we're interested in. And second, while traditional ethnography usually provides descriptions of social settings which compete with the actual descriptions offered by folks who are within those settings, ethnomethodology tries to describe the procedures that these folks use in their own depictions of the settings. So it's trying to separate the assumptions of the, the researcher from the lived experience of people within the settings. Now there are some typical techniques with ethnomethodology. Uh, one of these is experimental breaching. So if you want to learn about the norms of a society, of any group, break rules. So it's about the violation and observing the violations of some kind of norm in order to understand how important it is and the implications of a situation if it's broken. One of the best examples of these is I had, I, I've had an assignment for students in other classes where they had to go and violate a social norm. It might be standing too close to someone, sitting right next to them, pressing every button on the lift. Um, but the best one of these was that there was a a guy who went and shopped out of other people's grocery carts at the supermarket. So instead of looking around the shelves, he would just pick items out of people's grocery carts. Holy cow, this was the his description of of how people reacted was brilliant. People were angry. Somehow this notion of territory that we have we have found this thing and we have put it in our cart, it is now ours, even though we haven't paid for it, even though there's plenty of of uh, the goods on the shelves, it was this kind of a social norm.
Experimental breaching can be a really interesting approach to understanding, especially the importance of norms. A second example of techniques associated with ethnomethodology are understanding accounts. Basically, this is about understanding how people describe events and situations that have occurred. So if you get them to, if you say, so what happened here? When they're unpacking their descriptions, you can interpret their values, their attitudes, their subject, subjective norms and organizations and, and society more broadly. If you go to different people within the same organization who've all seen the same thing happen and you ask them to tell you about it, you start understanding the key ways that people might interpret and evaluate their own experiences. You also start to understand the organization's culture as well. So listening to people's stories, finding some event that has happened, and then figuring out, so how would you describe this event? Going around, you see the influence of perspective. And third is conversational analysis. So this is about listening to normal conversations as they happen and trying to interpret them in the context of what's happening in the organization and so on. So ethnomethodology is really about trying, not trying to describe the big picture, which is ethnography, but digging down into the details. If you like this kind of idea, ethnomethodology can be a really interesting approach to research in organizations, amongst consumers, in a lot of different kinds of contexts. So if we apply ethnomethodology in organizations, we can understand, therefore, the practices and their implications. We can also understand the flexibility of different social processes. And from a management perspective, it's about developing flexible management approaches based on the different types of experiences and expectations that employees might have. And there are a couple of really good examples of ethnomethodology. The first is Zimmerman's record keeping study. So Zimmerman describes how welfare caseworkers enact processes and procedures for intake work when they're dealing with their clients so that they can make their decisions about eligibility and follow-up care. This is the kind of work that's been really well developed in the UK to focus on practices and public bureaucracies in order hopefully to improve them and point out some of the challenges there. In Silverman and Jones' work staff selection in or large organizations, the Pair studied how power relations are reflected in some of the language used. Their main concern was how their interviews were built around verbal and nonverbal exchanges. So in looking at interviewing for jobs, we can understand what's acceptable to do, what's unacceptable, what's expected and unexpected. So when we're trying to get a better understanding of any kind of a process like this, ethnomethodology really focuses on the language, the interactions, and the norms. So it's a really strong and interesting kind of methodology to take a look at. Then the third type of methodology that I want to talk about is the critical incident technique. The objective with the critical incident technique, or CIT, is that it's an approach for collecting direct observations of behavior and events that have had a big significance and meet some kind of methodologically defined criteria, which we'll talk about. These observations are then kept track of as incidents, and then it's used to solve very practical problems. So a critical incident can be described as one that makes a contribution either positively or negatively to an organization, to a particular activity. So they can be gathered in various ways, but typically respondents are asked to tell a story about the experience that they've had. Where this differs from ethnomethodology is the focus on the critical incident. With ethnomethodology, you look at, you tend to look like with ethnography at the more routine or everyday kinds of practices. Critical incident technique focuses on the exceptional. A major event has happened that affects the organization, something along those lines. So the process for critical incident technique is first reviewing a critical incident, seeing if it has the potential for the impact that it would act to make it useful. Second, fact-finding. 
It's about collecting the details of the incident. Third, identifying the issues involved. So trying to figure out what were the causes, what were the effects, what were the precipitating incidents, what happened in a, in a meaningful kind of way. Then also understanding the decisions to resolve those issues and evaluating whether those solutions that were used actually work or not. So how can CIT be applied in organizations? If we want to think about how to apply CIT in organizations, we can think of it as having four big objectives, typically speaking. First is to develop training opportunities, such as accident investigation. Second is to identify problem-solving roles. Third is about organizational personnel development. And fourth is quite a useful tool for market research. So if we think about some of the examples of CIT, its origin was in investigating pilots in wartime and other life and death situations. So it meant that it identified the top priorities in the man-machine system or any kind of complex action-oriented situation. These priorities feed into procedures for selecting, training, and also in terms of, in the original studies, cockpit instrument and design. In healthcare, CIT is used in situations where direct examination of clinical staff and researchers can help them pe better understand their roles and help them solve practical problems. For example, in healthcare research, CIT can be a good resource in identifying the experiences of a patient in a healthcare setting, exploring the dimensions of patient-provider interactions, and determining patient responses to illness and to treatments. CIT is also widely used in organizational development as a research technique for identifying organizational problems. So using CIT de-emphasizes the inclusion of general opinions about management and work procedures, but really focuses on the problems that have emerged. So although the CIT method first appeared in the marketing literature 30 years ago, the major catalyst for using CIT method in service research appears to have been in a journal of marketing study conducted by Bittner, Booms, and Tetrio in 1990 that investigated the sources of satisfaction and dissatisfaction in service encounters. Since then, the Bittner et al. article had since that article appeared, nearly 200 CIT studies have appeared in marketing-related literature. So overall, no matter whether we're thinking about crisis, whether we're thinking about personnel development and training, management, or market research, CIT can be a particularly good technique. But no matter whether you ch might choose ethnography, ethno-methodology, or CIT, the approach for collecting data remains fairly similar. So the biggest challenges are starting out with deciding what to study, getting access to observational settings and the folks, and also then determining the role of the observer. So the question really is, how do you want to be within the setting? So like most things, it's a spectrum. You can be a complete participant. What this means is that you are a member of the organization. You're studying a group that you already belong to. So if you belong to a social club, a sports team, if you are working for a particular organization, you're there, you're going about your work day, but you're also systematically making observations, keeping notes. The other end of the spectrum is as a complete observer. The Hawthorne studies where the observers came in in laboratory coats, everyone knew that they were there to observe, and they never participated with folks. They were just there as the fly on the wall. And then partway in between, you get the participant observer who is joining in with some of the activities, but people know that they're there. People know that they're observing them, but they'll still participate along. They're primarily a participant. Flip that around where you're primarily observer, but every once in a while you might jump into it. That's the observer as participant. So any of these is legitimate. Any of them is appropriate. But it's about trying to put together an ethical and, and useful study in terms of the, the objectives and the goals that you have. But when you're collecting data with observational research, there are some guidelines to think about. First 
is the length of the observations. The more times that you can observe, the longer that you're embedded, obviously it's the better. A rule of thumb suggests that for a decent study, you need to have at least 10 one-hour observations. Again, the more that you can get into it and the more that you can interact, obviously it's going to be richer, better data. But what do you observe? Well, who matters? How do initial interactions occur? How do people within the setting interact? Where and when do people interact? What communication events are significant? Any of these can be things that are observed. What's important in those first observations or two, the first one or two observations, is that you're trying to get an induction into the environment. And so you start making decisions as a researcher about how to proceed and how to move through this, this observation. But it's also about being systematic. Beyond your first couple of observations, because you'll have a game plan beforehand, but after those first one or two, you need to be quite regimented in what you're observing, what you're planning, so that you have the level of rigor and that you're consistently looking for similar kinds of issues. This is largely driven by your literature review, and it's largely driven by previous research, but it helps to direct your understanding of the situation so that you can be a useful observer. But how do you record your obser observations? Well, there's three or four different ways that you can do this. First are your field notes. As you're going about your observations, you need to take some notes. It's not about recording everything, but critical moments when something is really revealed, where you see something that is like an aha, and then making sure that you capture that as quickly as possible. Second, our activity logs. Now you may not be able to take field notes as you're going along throughout your day, but what you need to do as quickly as possible is to create some kind of activity log. What happened when? Usually this should be done on the same day as the observation. And like with the journals or the self-observational journals, what you're trying to capture is is what happened, what kind of a time frame, how you feel about it, your reflections on it. So the activity log is a description of what happened when, uh, you know, a timeline, if you will. The journal and the self-observational journals are about your critical reflections, trying to get what your thinking is, how it's evolved, a reflection from a day to day. What you find is the more that you do this, the more sophisticated your understanding of the situation is. So you can watch the process develop throughout. And then finally is the experience or the sampling method. So when you're recording it, you're trying to figure out what are the experiences that you've had. That may be something that you focus on all by itself. But so no matter what combination that you use, what you're trying to do when you're recording your observations is get as accurate and detailed of an account as possible, where you have direct quotations, include them, summaries. You're better off when you're recording your data not to leave anything out because over time, our memories are not particularly good. We start to introduce bias into it. So if you can capture the information as close to your observation as possible, you will have a much better account than later on. But then that comes to the data analysis. So you also need to be systematic in this approach. And this is where research methodology and readings about different ways to go about interpreting qualitative data is going to be necessary. But it's about taking the pages and pages and pages of notes that you have, and you should have a lot of notes. If you're doing any kind of naturalistic inquiry, you need to make sure that you have a notebook full, if you will, that you are not just taking things for granted, not assuming that you're going to remember, because the data analysis process is about reducing the data, trying to put it into categories that might emerge, trying to, depending on your theory, if you're directing it you know, in a theoretical way, how can you keep track of all the information and make it digestible? And it's also then about how do you explain? If you're going to come to, to 
summarizing what happened, your impressions of the situation, and what you found, you have to be able to do that in a fairly succinct kind of manner. Result sections and your whole dissertation, for example, is not an infinitely long kind of a beast. You need to be pretty brief in how you do it. Then finally, with data analysis, is about theory development. How you're applying theory, or if you're developing theory, that you're doing so in a fairly organized way. Make sure that you take a look at the different methodology, research books about naturalistic inquiry, and it'll give you approaches and methods for data analysis that are fairly useful. But what I want to leave you with is this. When it comes to naturalistic inquiry, it's about a great narrative. There are three kinds of narratives that you can tell. The first is the realistic narrative. And this is about the story told from the point of view of the people studied. So if you're trying to talk about it in terms of a movie, it's about just letting people watch the movie, experience it as people experience. The second option is the confessional tale. And this is making you as the researcher a part of the experience. This is also acceptable, but it focuses primarily on the researcher and his or her experiences dur during the field work. So, for example, in my grocery shopping cart um, study, that's a great example of a confessional tale because it's about, it was about that student's experience in going and shopping out of other people's carts and then drawing conclusions about social norms around grocery shopping. But there's also the impressionist tale. This is about blending too, who you are as a researcher and explaining how you enter the story, but also trying to talk about the people that you've studied in a, in a meaningful way. But when we're talking about the story and talking about naturalistic inquiry, we are almost always talking about telling a great narrative. This is why these are compelling to read. It's also why they're interesting. Again, for follow-up, make sure that you take a look at your research methods textbooks for the ways and the approaches and for more depth in this. But for now, this has been our podcast in Naturalistic Inquiry.